Now, for some time now, we've been trying to incorporate uh, our growing understanding of epigenetics into uh, furthering our understanding of pathways about how early life experience can come to lead to long-term biological change. And so today, um, I'll, I'll focus on uh, some of these, particularly on DNA methylation, that we've certainly heard a lot about before the break. Uh, but uh, I'll mention uh, as well that in most of these studies, we don't see effects just uh, linked to DNA methylation, but also histone modifications. MicroRNAs are similarly affected by many of these life experiences and probably collectively uh, can be thought of as uh, consequences and possible links between our early life experience and long-term outcomes. Now, I'll focus on two particular periods of development. Uh, first on experiences that we have during the prenatal period, uh, and then focusing a little bit on the postnatal period. And of course, the prenatal period is a, is, can be seen as a window of opportunity. There is uh, very dynamic changes in the developing brain, and this can create a window during which experiences uh, can come to lead to long-term neurobiological and behavioral outcomes. Oh, I've lost my slide forwarder again. Oh, there we go, it's a bit slow. Okay, so we've been thinking of a number of uh, early life experiences uh, from a, from the, that can occur during the prenatal period, and uh, in particular how stress that mothers experience during their own pregnancy can come to lead to long-term outcomes. And certainly we know in humans that maternal stress during pregnancy is associated with a number of outcomes, including risk of prematurity, lower birth weight, increased reactivity of the HPA response to stress, and later life increased risk of depression and anxiety. Now, in thinking about the mechanisms through which this might occur, through which uh, exposure to maternal stress might come to lead to infant outcomes that then create the ground uh, work for a later life increased risk of psychopathology, there's a number of ways in which we may think about the, the potential uh, uh, role of epigenetics in the biological embedding of these experiences. So we can think of perhaps the direct pathway whereby something about mothers being stressed, and I, I say something because it could be increased uh, glucocorticoids, it can be induced uh, uh, changes in the inflammatory system, we don't exactly know, and there's, there's certainly a lot of work being focused on what it is that changes in stressed mothers, but this perhaps could have uh, effects on a number of epigenetic outcomes, and this may li link these experiences to uh, outcomes such in, uh, during fetal development and in infancy. Now, another critical pathway and, and something that we've been exploring quite extensively in my lab is how these uh, experiences uh, in the form of prenatal maternal distress could affect epigenetic changes within the placenta and how these epigenetic changes might then come to affect fetal development and infant outcomes and certainly we know that dysregulation of imprinted genes within the placenta can have uh, very significant consequences for infant development so any disruption to those epigenetic programs may, uh, be, may be an important causal pathway um, but of course, there may be also an indirect route whereby maternal distress experience during pregnancy feeds forward and affecting the postnatal quality of the mother-infant interactions, which may in and of themselves trigger changes, epigenetic changes, uh, and changes in infant outcomes. Now, we've been exploring the question of prenatal stress and its effects on gene expression uh, in the placenta to, to further our understanding of this biolog biological embedding of experience. And particularly, we've been focused on uh, certain target genes that we know to be quite critical, either in placental function or in the regulation of H HPA function within this model. And so in the, the initial studies that we did looking at prenatal stress, we focused on 11-beta HSD2, which is an enzyme that is fairly highly expressed within the placenta and that can inactivate glucocorticoids, that can take cortisol or corticosterone and inactivate into cortisone. 
and thus serve as a buffering agent so that maternal stress hormones are not directly passing in their, in their um, concentration into the fetal compartment leading to uh, programming of the infant brain. Of course, having some stress hormone cross the placenta is incredibly important for development, especially for long development, which is why we give synthetic glucocorticoids to women who are uh, at risk for preterm labor. Uh, but of course, these could potentially have stress programming effects on the brain. And so we did some studies in the labs with rat, uh, rats where we exposed females to stress. In this case, these data are generated based on stress experienced in the last trimester of pregnancy, but I will note that timing of the stressor is going to be very important for, for these effects. And we looked at the consequence for the expression of 11-beta HST2 in the placenta fetal cortex and hypothalamus. And so the placenta in this case was extracted uh, just uh, close to the time of parturition, so at about postnatal day, uh, sorry, at gestational day 19. What we see is that increased levels of maternal stress, uh, in, in this case in the form of a restraint stress experienced during the third trimester of pregnancy, led to a reduction in the expression of 11-beta HSD2. And so not only are these females um, more, uh, uh, having more stress hormone, they're releasing more stress hormone because they're under physical restraint, but the enzyme that is within the placenta that perhaps serves as a buffering agent between maternal stress hormones and the fetus is also being down-regulating, re regulated. And this could lead to a number of changes in the developing brain as a function of increased glucocorticoid exposure. Now, this could be seen as adaptive. So if a female is under ve very severe amounts of stress during late pregnancy, perhaps the best strategy is to increase glucocorticoid exposure to the fetus to enhance the pace of lung development uh, to prepare that offspring for a preterm birth. So these could be conceived as adaptive, but of course the cost of lung development in this case is increased uh, stress reactivity in the brain. Now, we also were interested in looking whether there were changes in DNA methylation that could possibly be associated with the experience of maternal stress. And so within our three tissues, the placenta, the fetal cortex, uh, and hypothalamus, we examined DNA methylation within a stretch of the promoter region of the 11-beta HSD2 2 gene uh, that's upstream from the transcription start site and that contains a lot of transcription factor binding elements. So this is a region that we think is meaningful for the regulation of the gene, and we were interested to see whether there were differences in DNA methylation that could be predicted by the experience of maternal stress. And so these are our three tissues. In the top, we have the fetal hypothalamus, the fetal cortex, and the placenta. Now keep in mind, we only saw the differences in expression in the placenta. So we saw decreased expression of 11-beta HSD2. Uh, and when we look at the DNA methylation uh, patterns, we see modest increases in the methylation uh, of the placenta of the 11-beta HSD2 gene in the placenta as an ex uh, associated with the experience of stress. Now, we see no differences in DNA methylation in the fetal cortex. Interestingly, in the fetal hypothalamus, we see hypomethylation, or reduced levels of methylation, in the 11-beta HSD2 gene associated with stress, despite seeing no differences in expression. I think this is a, a common theme, this disjoint between the actual patterns of methylation and the expression that we observe. But at least in the placenta, we, we do see consistencies with expression and DNA methylation patterns. Now, importantly, and I think this is important in the brain, certainly, but also important in the placenta, the placenta isn't one tissue. There are multiple different cell types uh, that we need to consider when thinking of, of any kind of biological change, whether it be gene expression or DNA methylation. And so we examined uh, the expression of 11-beta HSD2, but also 11-beta HSD21, uh, sorry, HSD1, which is also involved in the metabolism of glucocorticoids, and DNMT1 and DNMT3A. And we saw some very specific effects within certain tissue layers. So our changes in 11-beta HSD2 are very specific to the labyrinth zone of the placenta. And so most of our, when we do a tissue punch through the, through the placenta, that is the majority of the, the tissue found. But when we actually d uh, do specific dissections of each region, we see that that effect is really, the, the effect that we see is really driven by the labyrinth 
labyrinthosome. We also see changes in DNMT1, decreases in expression of this enzyme in the labyrinth zone as a function of stress. DNMT3A, interestingly, is decreased in the decidual cells and chorionic plate of this placental tissue. So when we're thinking about uh, targets to look at, we really need to think about uh, the location within the placental tissue. Now, it's important to note that stress is not going to affect one gene, it's going to affect many. Um, that's what stress does. It coordinates uh, very broad biological systems. And maternal stress during pregnancy is no different. We've looked at a number of genes within the placenta. This actually is from data driven from a, a slightly different model of stress. So we've been doing a lot of translational work uh, in humans where we have mothers who aren't experiencing the kind of severe trauma of, uh, let's say, a restraint stress during a limited period of pregnancy, but are stressed throughout their pregnancy by mild stressors. And so we tried to recapitulate that experience with our rats in the lab by using chronic variable stressors that were fairly mild. But still Still saw the decrease uh, in 11 beta HSD2, saw a decrease in DNMT1, uh, which is consistent with what I showed in the previous slide. But of course, there are a number of other genes that are also changed in their expression, some of which are in imprinted genes uh, and that are going to be very important and, and interesting for our follow up uh, analysis that we're doing on DNA methylation. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the overall pattern, the genes that I'm showing you here are all decreased in their expression, uh, but some are done, uh, decreased in a very sex-specific way, either only in males or only in females. And this is a very consistent theme within the prenatal and postnatal uh, literature on early life experiences and how that affects long-term outcomes, that there may be a different response based on what sex you are. And continuing on that theme of sex-specific effects, we were really interested uh, in other prenatal exposures and how they might come to be uh, embedded at a biological level. And so we've been working with the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health. Um, and for many years now, this center has been doing very interesting work on how pollutants within our environment, air pollutant, pesticides, um, and various other toxins could lead to long-term neurodevelopmental uh, immune and metabolic outcomes. Now, uh, in their most recent iteration of their, their center grant, they were interested in, in incorporating some analyses of epigenetic changes in, uh, to better understand how it may be that these experiences come to lead to long-term outcomes. And so, in particular, we've been looking at the exposure to bisphenol A. Now, bisphenol A is an endocrine disrupting chemical. It is found, it is used in the manufacture of plastics. And of course, we absorb some uh, of, bis of the bisphenol A when we consume products that have been placed in plastic containers, whether they're cups or bottles. Um, BPA is also found in the lining of aluminum cans. And you also absorb uh, BPA when you handle grocery store receipts. And there's been some very interesting work on, on this. And uh, though we may be able to metabolize uh, as adults uh, this, uh, this ex these low levels of exposure to BPA, the concern is that when mothers are exposed to bisphenol A during pregnancy, the fetal tissues accumulate higher levels of this, of this compound than is deemed safe uh, for, for their development. So we've been exploring this with the, the uh, CCEH. Uh, to look at the biological effects. Now, we know from some of the longitudinal studies that the center has done that there are sex-specific effects of uh, gestational exposure to bisphenol A. So in this case, this study uh, measured in urine samples the bisphenol A in pregnant mothers in, um, in Manhattan and then examined years later uh, child behavior problems amongst other outcomes and found that high levels of maternal BPA during pregnancy was associated with increased behavior problems in boys, particularly aggressive behaviors. Um, in girls, it had the opposite effect. So it actually reduced the level of behavioral problems as, as indicated by the child behavior checklist. So obviously, then, it's very important for us to continue to incorporate sex as a critical variable when we're thinking about the impact of these exposures. So we've been taking the humans, working with the, the uh, individuals, collecting data on humans, and applying this to a mouse model in which we can directly expose individuals to BPA during pregnancy. So in this case, we took bulb sea mice, and they ingested BPA uh, daily throughout their pregnancy. So we put it in corn oil, and they, they ate it up very rapidly. 
We characterize the, uh, the quality of mother-infant interactions during postnatal development because we know that these are very important either <coughs> mediating or moderating variables in offspring development. Uh, and then we, at postnatal day 28, so at the time of weaning, uh, we examined behavior and we also looked at gene expression and DNA methylation in various tissues within the brain. Now, within this experimental design, we also included several doses of bisphenol A. And this actually ended up being very interesting from a statistical uh, uh, framework. And we were able to ask some statistical questions that we might not have if we just randomly selected one dose. We selected l fairly low doses, so 2 and 20 micrograms per kilogram are lower than the EPA considered safe dose for BPA, 200 is above. So it's about 40, 40 micrograms per kilogram is the EPA safe dose. And we examined the impact on uh, both mothers and offspring of these varying doses. Now, one, one element that's very clear in the study of endocrine disruptors is the nonlinear dose response curves that you can achieve. These nonlinear dose response curves are very important when we come, it comes to thinking about safe doses of a drug, right? So it, not, it is not necessarily the case that a high dose will have a lesser effect than a lower dose. And in fact, at a high dose, you may see no effect. At a lower dose, you might see a significant effect. And this is what we found when we looked at estrogen receptor alpha uh, expression within the hypothalamus of individuals who've been exposed to vehicle or uh, varying doses of BPA. And so what we see is a nonlinear dose response curve and also a very robust sex-specific effect. And so amongst females, there is a U-shaped function in which lowest, the lowest doses of BPA have uh, the highest impact. They suppress expression of, of uh, of estrogen receptor alpha in the hypothalamus, this actually to some extent is normalized when we go into the higher dose. Um, in contrast, our males have an upregulation of estrogen receptor alpha at the lower doses and a significant uh, uh, compensation or reduction at the 200 microgram per kilogram dose. What these curves are effectively doing uh, is altering the sexual dimorphism in estrogen receptor alpha levels in the brain, which we know to be very important for sex-specific behavior. So uh, we're at, at the vehicle levels and 200 microgram uh, levels, you're seeing females with higher levels of estrogen receptors and males with lower levels, but that is being abolished at the low doses of bisphenol A. Now, we see a very similar curve if we look at DNA uh, methyltransferase 1 within the hypothalamus, with males having uh, a, a, an inverted U-shaped function and females uh, a, a U-shaped function in response to dose uh, in terms of measure of the expression of this gene. And so this would uh, suggest that there may be widespread changes, uh, epigenetic changes, uh, changes in DNA methylation within these brain tissues as a function of BPA induced changes in uh, the, the levels of this enzyme. Now, we then looked to see whether there was differences in DNA methylation uh, within the estrogen receptor alpha promoter as a function of uh, BPA exposure. And there had been some previous work illustrating these effects in non-neuronal tissues. Uh, and so we were interested in whether these changes were occurring in, in the brain and possibly uh, be linked to some of the behavioral outcomes that we had observed. Now, if we look in various brain regions, so we, we sampled from a number of brain regions to look at both expression and DNA methylation, we found that in the male cortex, we find that the, the 20, dose, 20 microgram per kilogram dose of BPA led to increased levels of DNA methylation and compared to vehicle control treated males, we saw no effect in females, right? So again, a sex specific epigenetic response uh, that is observed in males but not females. If we go to a different brain region, we see a very different pattern. So we have uh, no, no effect in the male hypothalamus, but an effect in the female such that BPA-treated females have reduced levels of DNA methylation within the, pro the within, actually, this is not the promoter region, but in the shores of the promoter region of the estrogen receptor alpha A promoter. And so the direction of the effect and the nature of the effect on sex is going to be varying depending on what brain regions you look at. Now, in terms of behavioral outcomes, we were also interested in a number of behaviors, looking at stress reactivity, looking at learning and memory, 
Um, this is just a graph indi indicating the level of aggressive behavior, since that was one of the outcomes that had been observed in the, the human cohort. Um, in this cohort, we see that both sexes are showing some degree of increase in aggressive behavior, though, of course, notable the males are more aggressive overall than the females. The highest doses here are leading to the most robust behavioral change. So this is very interesting, very consistent with some of the other behaviors we've, uh, we've observed, where um, you're getting this very, very big increase with the highest dose at a behavioral level, even though there's some normalization of gene expression that is occurring. So it really argues for the need to understand the, the connections and circuitry that are generating these BPA-induced effects. Now, incorporated within these studies, we also examine the quality of mother-infant interactions during the postnatal period. And there certainly had been some previously published work illustrating that BPA not only affected the maternal behavior of offspring who were exposed in utero, but also affected the mothers who were being given the BPA during their own pregnancy. And we saw that uh, a number of maternal behaviors were affected by the, um, by the BPA treatments. And so we had um, uh, an effect on public and grooming and nursing, whereby the lowest doses seem to be suppressing the maternal behavior, and the higher doses seem to be uh, increasing the level of maternal behavior. Now, given these nonlinear effects, one critical question we asked, and certainly that's very important for understanding the, the link between BPA and long-term outcomes, is whether BPA is acting through postnatal maternal care to induce the changes in offspring development. So because we had measured the maternal care received by all the offspring in our study, we were able to statistically look at this question. And what we found in general was that BPA induced its effect you know, regardless of the change in, in maternal behavior. So it was able to induce these effects even when we controlled for the level of postnatal maternal care or in the BPA induced changes in maternal care. Now, there were several exceptions to that kind of common theme. One was the aggressive behavior, which is completely accounted for by BPA-induced changes in maternal behavior. And there were some regions uh, that we looked for DNA methylation changes as a consequence of BPA exposure and found none. What we realized is that BPA was associated with changes in methylation in one direction, whereas maternal care was associated with methylation in quite another, the two canceling themselves out so that we saw actually none when we went to do the analysis. So certainly thinking about the interplay between these prenatal programming events and postnatal maternal care and shaping uh, molecular and behavioral outcomes is going to be very important. So that brings us to postnatal maternal care um, and some perhaps magical thinking, but I won't talk about the glucocorticoid receptor, so maybe I won't get too, too much trouble. So one of the influences on uh, neurobiological outcomes is the quality of the early life in environment. And certainly in mammals, the quality of that experience is uh, in large part um, determined by the quality of mother-infant interactions. Though fathers can, uh, in, in some cases, contribute to this, very few species actually engage in paternal behavior. So we've been looking at our rats, where the, the fathers most definitely are not caring for the offspring, and characterizing the quality of mother-infant interactions, and looking at specific forms of maternal care. And uh, in this graph, I'm showing the distribution of licking grooming behavior, which is a critical form of maternal behavior that drives uh, development and survival of pups. It is a form of tactile stimulation, and it's, it stimulates somatosensory pathways and can have a number of long-term consequences for stress physiology uh, and for behavior. Now, within the context of this interest in maternal behavior and its influences, I was particularly interested in how mothers could shape the mothering behavior of their offspring. We certainly know in humans and primates that the experience of maternal care is in large part predictive of how we are as mothers. Um, and though it's not a 100% correlation, there's a, it is a strong influence. And certainly we see that in our Long Evans rats mothers in the lab. So if you experience low levels of licking and grooming in infancy, you are yourself uh, low in licking and grooming, whereas if you experience high levels of licking and grooming in your infancy, later on in life, you exhibit higher levels of this form of maternal care. Now, we were interested in the neurobiological changes that might be occurring within the, the uh, postnatal brain that lead to this later manifestation of behavioral differences in maternal care. 
And so we explored a number of pathways within the brain that had been illustrated in studies just looking at the maternal brain, brain in general. And within the medial preoptic area of the hypothalamus, which is very important for driving mammalian uh, maternal behavior, we saw that high levels of licking grooming was associated with increased oxytocin receptor density, increased estrogen sensitivity, and increased estrogen receptor alpha mRNA uh, within the MPOA. And importantly, these are differences that we observed in adult females, right? So the experience of maternal care is occurring during the first week of life. That's when mothers are maximally licking their pups. We see these effects later on in development. And so really the question we have is what events could lead to the sustained activation of estrogen, uh, estrogen receptor alpha in the hypothalamus that we presume is very important for driving some of the, the transmission of maternal behavior from mother to daughter. And again, we examined levels of DNA methylation uh, within the promoter region of the estrogen receptor alpha, and we looked at different developmental time points. Now, cross-fostering, I should note that cross-fostering at the time of birth uh, suggests that it is the quality of maternal care that you receive that pr predicts a lot of these long-term outcomes. Um, and so at postnatal day zero, we don't see any differences in, in DNA methylation. We don't even see them at postnatal day six. But you see some modest changes uh, observed at postnatal day 21 uh, and uh, in adulthood when the females are actually lactating, taking care of their offspring, such that those offspring who'd received high levels of licking grooming have slightly reduced levels of DNA methylation. Now, while these effects might be fairly small, the al they also occur within the context of other chromatin remodeling marks. And so in our offspring who've received high levels of licking grooming, we also see increased levels of H3K4 methylation and decreased levels of H3K9 methylation. So there are other uh, epigenetic events that are working in concert um, uh, and may be recruited by maternal care to generate some of the long-term changes in gene expression that we observe. Now, given that the changes that we see in DNA methylation are observable at postnatal day 21, we were interested in understanding whether the, these changes um, could lead to behavioral changes that are in a sense a precursor to what the females will be behaving like when they're with their offspring. So are the behavioral consequences of licking and grooming be, uh, observable at this time point when some of the molecular and gene expression changes that we, we've noted are observable? And so we looked at maternal sensitivity to pups. So obviously these females are juveniles, they're not able to produce their own offspring, but you can give them pups from a donor mother and see how they react to those, those pups. And offspring who've received high levels of licking and grooming have reduced latencies to engage in maternal behavior towards donor pups. Now this takes several days of, of exposure to the pups, and so we give them fresh pups each day and, and take the other pups and give them back to a lactating dam. Uh, but it's clear that these females are able to kind of adopt a maternal response to pups much earlier than those offspring who had received low levels of licking and grooming. And so a higher percentage of high licked and groomed offspring are able to uh, uh, exhibit maternal behavior. Now we have done cross-fostering at, at the day of birth, but uh, a, a very interesting question is, what is this period of sensitivity to maternal care, right? And so this has real world implications for understanding when we can target interventions, when those interventions will be maximally effective. If someone's had an impoverished early life experience, when can we intervene? Are there limits to, to uh, the ability to shift these patterns that we've observed? And so to answer this question, we conducted cross-fostering at postnatal day six. So we observe maternal behavior till day six, and that's how we good, get a good feel for the licking grooming behavior of the mothers. Um, and so by postnatal day six, we know whether the mothers are high or low licking grooming. Um, and so we had offspring that were reared with their birth mother and, and then cross-fostered at postnatal day six. Um, and then we had offspring who were cross-fostered a little time point later, so at postnatal day 10. So we had generated six different rearing conditions. And uh, within our analyses, we were able to compare offspring who had not been fostered to their siblings who had, right? So in none of these studies is it a within subject design because we're looking at uh, brain, brain gene expression patterns and that just won't work. So um, in this case, we can compare you at least to the, your sibling. And so we looked 
at change in latency from your non-fostered sibling as a function of cross-fostering at postnatal day six and postnatal day 10. The first outcome we looked at was uh, changes in latency to, to become maternal behavior towards foster pups. If you were cross-fostered at day six to a, a low-looking grooming female, that increased your latency. Uh, to, uh, sorry, if you, if you were uh, re reared by a low-looking grooming dam and then cross foster at day six, that shortened your latency to become maternal towards pups. So the experience of high levels of licking and grooming at postnatal day six and beyond was able to shift your phenotype. If we waited till postnatal day 10, <coughs> this was not effective in shifting this behavioral phenotype. If we look at estrogen receptor alpha expression within the medial preoptic area, we see, again, a pattern where po postnatal cross-fostering at day six is able to shift your levels of gene expression of estrogen receptor alpha within the hypothalamus, uh, but not if we wait until postnatal day 10. Now, it certainly could be the case that the, the gradual decline in maternal behavior over time is le lending itself such that the levels of maternal care are so low at this time point, they're not capable of driving changes in, uh, in offspring phenotype. Uh, but certainly it suggests that early interventions and interventions at least by postnatal day six might be effective in reversing some of these neurobiological and perhaps molecular changes. Now, we were interested in exploring whether we could manipulate this system so we could, if we drive up estrogen receptor alpha within the hypothalamus, could we reverse some of these behavioral phenotypes? So we used a viral vector approach where we inserted the viral vector, an overexpression vector, into the medial preoptic area and, uh, and then looked at the long-term consequences. We did this intervention at postnatal day four, so within that sensitive period. And what we find, so this is just looking at the levels of ER alpha and showing that our viral vector works. So basically, it got rid of the group differences in ER alpha within the hypothalamus of our offspring. <laughs> it also abolished group differences in maternal sensitivity. So directly targeting the estrogen receptor expression within the hypothalamus was meaningful for changing the behavioral uh, outcomes that we observed. And so these early life programming events uh, have consequences for the transmission of maternal behavior from one generation to the next. So we have the experience of maternal care leading to, amongst other things, changes in DNA methylation, changes in histone modifications. Uh, this uh, has consequences for gene expression that then feeds back and affects the way in which those mothers behave, those offspring behave as mothers to their offspring. And so the cycle can repeat and repeat. Now, this, this is what I will call an experience-dependent transmission of behavior. Each transmission through each generation relies on the presence of, of the maternal care. The maternal care is how these effects are being driven. And if you modify maternal care in some way by stressing the mothers, by putting juveniles in social isolation or social enrichment, you disrupt this transmission. This is in contrast to some of the more, uh, more speculative and, and I, I guess really interesting work as well on germline inheritance. Can the experiences of a parent be transmitted to the next generation, influencing offspring development. And we've been very interested in this question, um, primarily because we think there are alternative routes to consider before we go leaping into the germline for thinking about environmentally induced change. Not that it can't happen, but there are other moderating variables. So we've been looking at the, now we're focused on the father, so we can certainly do <coughs> lots of things in the life history of fathers and look at offspring development. And in this case, we've been exploring paternal nutrition and how that might come to be transmitted uh, to offspring uh, and affect their development. So we've been exposing male mice to either food restriction uh, or control-fed uh, control conditions. And we've been mating with them with a control-fed female uh, and having a two-week mating period. Uh, the father is removed and has absolutely no direct contact with the offspring, uh, but we characterize the maternal behavior that those offspring receive postnatally and look at offspring development. Now, interestingly, and this is very consistent with a lot of the data that we've been generating through some of these paternal exposure models, is that the fathers influence several aspects of the prenatal and postnatal experience of their offspring. So if you are a female and you are mated with a control-fed male, 
you actually um, uh, have gain less weight during pregnancy than if you were mated with a food restricted male. So the food restricted male of females, uh, the females who have been mated with a food restricted male actually gain more weight during pregnancy. They also nurse their offspring more frequently during the early postnatal period. Now there's a number of theories in behavioral ecology that can explain rather well why this occurs and, and focused on how females can adjust their maternal investment in offspring dependent on mate quality. Now typically that mate quality has thought to be genetically um, characterized, but there's certainly uh, an element where the environment that fathers experience can affect their mate quality. So dissociating these maternal effects from perhaps some sort of inherited epigenetic change in the fathers um, is very challenging. Uh, and there's no perfect strategy for doing them because any kind of strategy you use is going to create artificial conditions and perhaps disrupt some of the epigenetic program you think is important. But we tried anyway. So we had our natural mating condition, which again is where a f a f either a control-fed or food-restricted male is mated with a, a control-fed female. We also had an embryo transfer condition. So we had visectomized control-fed males mated with surrogate females and then implanted with embryos that were generated through the sperm from either control-fed or food-restricted males. Now what this does is eliminate the cues that the surrogates might be using to change their investment, right? So they're not seeing the males uh, and they're only gestating the embryos that have been created from the male sperm. Now, We've been finding a, a number of interesting effects, one which is that if you use this embryo transfer technique, you get rid of the altered maternal investment occurring during the prenatal or postnatal period. So our solid lines here are natural mating condition, right? So where we have gestational weight gain higher if you've mated with a, a, a food-restricted male, but we don't see any changes uh, in uh, gestational weight gain if you've been conceived, if the mothers have been implanted with the, with the embryos and have had no direct exposure to the males. The same with maternal licking grooming behavior. We see differences with higher levels of licking grooming behavior in the food restricted natural mating condition, but no differences in the embryo transfer condition. Now, of interest, there are some effects that seem to be in offspring that seem to persist even though we're getting rid of these changes in maternal investment. So we looked at sucrose preference, which is typically used in rodents as an indication of, of anhedonic behavior. So the less sucrose they consume, the more depressive-like they are. Um, and we found that in female offspring, it didn't matter whether you would conceive through embryo transfer or natural mating. If your father was food restricted, you have reduced levels of sucrose preference. And this is very consistent with some work that's published from Eric Nessler's lab, where they also have seen through their social defeat model that when they use embryo transfer, that the depressive-like phenotypes can be transmitted to offspring, uh, but some of the other phenotypes are not. Now, what I think make, this makes very clear is that we need to really embrace the complexities of reproduction when we're thinking about the ways in which traits can be recapitulated generation after generation, the way this transmission is occurring. So certainly, um, there is a, a nice, strong behavioral ecology literature suggesting that females will adjust their reproductive investment depending on mate quality, whether that quality is derived from age, toxin exposure, nutrition, and drugs. And certainly there have been mate choice studies that suggest that not only can females detect differences in the environmental exposures of males they mate with, but they, could, they would, if they were given the choice, avoid mating with those males. So, um, and in response to those cues, they may increase or decrease their level of investment. So there's a hypothesis that females try to compensate if they detect problems in the males, if there's some sort of genetic defect that might uh, compromise their offspring's development. And the same could be true if, even if this were an epigenetic uh, uh, change that is occurring as a function of these exposures in the males. So that could indirectly, of course, affect offspring development because the mother is affecting, uh, it's affecting prenatal and postnatal experiences of the pups. But of course, this is not um, uh, inconsistent with uh, the, another route of transmission, which is where there might be direct 
transmission of epigenetic marks that are her inherited by the offspring. If there is disruption to those marks, those marks might be inherited um, and cause changes uh, in the offspring development, but also those could be a trigger for some of the prenatal and postnatal changes in investment. So we know that the placenta is a big regulator of maternal behavior occurring during both the prenatal and postnatal period. And if there are changes in the epigenetic programs in that tissue, that could have widespread implications for offspring development. So I will stop there, uh, but just acknowledge some of the key contributors to this work. Uh, Kate Jensen, who focused on the prenatal stress work. Maria Kundakovic, who's been working on BPA. And Rahia Mashud, who's been exploring the role of fathers uh, and how they can shape their offspring development. So thank you very much. <laughs>